Hi everyone, welcome to the Brown History Podcast. My name is Essen and this is episode 20. On today's episode, we're going to explore the life and works of the late Kashmiri American poet Aga Shahid Ali. And our guest today is writer and translator Manan Kapoor, who just released an extensive biography on Shahid Ali titled A Map of Longings. Honestly, amazing book. I could not put it down. I highly, highly recommend it. Usually, I give a little background information before every episode, just to give listeners a little context before they start the episode, but this episode is pretty self-explanatory. It's also 3 in the morning, and I am exhausted editing this episode, so yeah. Anyways, if you're enjoying this episode, and you're enjoying Brown History Podcast and the Brown History Instagram page, and you want to help out, and you want to support it, then please consider being a Patreon. Just visit brownhistorypodcast.com. Your help goes a long, long way. Let's start this episode. Here we go. Thank you for doing this. It's, a, it's an honor to talk yeah, to you. It's a pleasure to be uh, speaking with you, really. I yeah. really, really, really loved your book. I could not put it down. It was so fascinating. And I'm not even, okay. a, I'm not even a poem guy. But when I read that book, it right. was just fascinating to see not just like the poems and not just about him, but also just like the history of South Asia through poetry, the the, the process it takes to translate right, poem, right, right. English, Fez Ahmed Fez, uh, right. all these English poets, this, I don't know, it was just really, really fascinating. And I can't wait to go back right. and read all his poems. Um, right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I'm glad I'm, you like the book. Yeah, yeah, and it's giving me a little anxiety because I don't want to. I want this episode to give the book justice. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, no. I mean, I'm sure. I guess my first question would be, you know, why? What made him so special, and why did you pick him to kind of dedicate two, three years writing about him? Shahid was a very special poet for me personally because when I started reading his poems, it was, uh, it was unlike anything I'd ever read. So when I started reading Shahid's poetry when I was 15 or 16, I think it had a very major impact on me because the poems that we were reading at school were completely different. Um, those were English poets who were talking about the sun and spring and stuff like that, you know. And Shahid was sort of the first poet who really made uh, sense to me in terms of, because his language reflected the South, East, the South Asian experience in so many ways, right? But as I started reading more, I realized one thing that, well, you had this poet and he writes beautiful and wonderful poetry. But uh, the more I read about his life, I think that's what really like uh, led me to, I mean, you know, write his biography and like do two or three years of research and uh, put in all this work because I think Shahid, des- like his life deserved to be celebrated. He was really someone special because he wasn't just an interesting person, but also the sort of like a reverent uh, person who would like crack all these dark jokes and, uh, I mean, when the more I started reading about his life, the more I think like it demanded to be written about. It was one of those things, you know. So in so many ways, and I think this is the, I mean, this is a sentiment that a lot of uh, young readers of Shahid's poetry from the subcontinent share, that um, not only was he a good poet, but also the anecdotes from his life and in so many ways how he was an embodiment of his work. And all that comes through. Uh, in his poetry, and I think a lot of young people from uh, South Asia like, uh, really relate to all of that. And the journey, I mean, his process of dealing with the English language and how he enriched it and all of that. So I think for me, like it was, he was the one who stood out really, because I mean, there are other poets as well. Uh, if you look at A.K. Raman, A.K. Ramanajan and Arun Kulakar, who I think I've mentioned in the book as well. But uh, for me, I think Shahid, like really stood out and he was someone I could relate to whose poetry I could like read and respond to for the first time like when I was 15 16 so I think you know it's it's been quite a few years since I've started reading Child's works actually yeah he grew up in South Asia in a very kind of multicultural multi-religious uh, environment and then he moved to the states to study and to teach he considered himself exile but he really wasn't exile a lot of poets from India actually moved to uh, from this continent have moved to the US to teach there and pursue their careers uh, in the US. Uh, for example, there's, uh, as I mentioned, like A.K. Ramanujan spent a lot of time in the US and he wrote there. But I think in Shahid's case, he he called himself an exile. And to some extent, that was, uh, you know, what they call uh, poet speak. Uh, but uh, to some degree, it was also the fact that uh, when he moved to the U.S. in uh, 1975, in December, 
uh, he didn't come back to the subcontinent for about, I think, eight years. And that was a really long spell because uh, he was there and uh, he was constantly reading poetry. He was doing his PhD and all of that. And he was comfortable in the US. But in so many ways, uh, that was the first time that he spent time away from home on his own. And uh, I think that plus, I think, you know, the fact that he was constantly like uh, thinking about Kashmir, thinking about home, his childhood and, uh, you know, all the uh, all the anecdotes and instances. I think that really like shaped his poetry because for the first time he could look back at home and, you know, memory came into play. So when you look at a poem like uh, Postcard from Kashmir, all of that stems from memory and from that, you know, exilic feeling, even though it's not really an exile, he was never banished from a nation state or like, uh, you know, a country or any, anything of that sort. But it was more of a, you know, feeling that he had imposed on himself so that, you know, this, 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 this uh, language could develop this, because in, in, in a lot of ways, like, I mean, when you look at someone like Fez, and uh, when Shahid moved to the US, no one had heard of Fez Ahmed Fez. No. And for him, that was a you know big thing for because he'd grown up listening to Fez. Fez was the biggest poet like that he knew of. Uh, he was his poems uh, were recited at his home. Begum Akhtar, who he absolutely loved, she sang his uh, guzzles. But when he moved to the US, he realized that no one really knew about uh, Fez Ahmed Fez, and that came as a shock to him. So in a lot of ways, uh, the landscape of American poetry was also alien to Shahid and that was something that he tried to enrich through his language through all the metaphors and uh, you know this continental experience that he brought and which later I mean eventually like developed in his language and now I mean it's it's um, when you look at like how he transformed the guzzle I think I think all of them all of those things stem from memory and like all the you know how he placed himself as an exile even though he was not so really because in, in so many interviews uh, when you read about Shahid's uh, you know, when people question him, well, you're never, you're not really an exile. So why do you call yourself an exile? And I think that's where he really starts talking about it and says that, well, I'm not. But in so many ways that in the world right now, when you're moving, when uh, you're in a different place, you're not home, you feel like an exile. So, I mean, that's, that's, yeah. So that was, and I think it shaped his poetry in so many ways. So that was the most important thing here. Um, this this exilic feeling that he sort of imposed on himself. Yeah. Wow. What when he was translating? Yeah. Uh, there's this chapter about him translating Fez's poems, and right. You know, you kind of explain how hard it is for someone who doesn't speak the language to translate the poems. If I ever want to read somebody from South Asia, should I be looking for translators who know the language? I think the most important thing is that you read translators whose first language is English. Right. So suppose you're, in, you're reading poems in, in English, right? So yeah. I think the most important thing is that you read translations by the translators who whose first language is English because that adds in a lot of things. Uh, Naomi Lazad and Victor Kiernan had translated Fez. But there's, yeah, that's that's another thing. There's another aspect to it. It's, it's, it's really like a very complex thing where you need to understand the, you know, the, the really small things about, suppose, say, a language like Urdu, where uh, Tera Dard, the term Tera Dard can mean two things, which is the pain that you've caused and the pain that you feel. So when a Western translator is translating Fez, they will not know that, they, they might not be aware of, uh, of this duality of, uh, of, of the term, that it can mean two things. And a lot of Urdu and Persian poetry plays on this like duality. And like, you know, uh, if you look at someone like Fez, he talks about the beloved, but the beloved could be anything from God to, uh, you know, to revolution. So that's something that translators really need to understand. So I think, and it's really hard for like, you know, when you're translating, like, uh, because there is a lot of cultural context. So suppose say tomorrow you want to read Fez, I think Shahid would be the perfect person because he is a poet of the English language, but his roots are there in uh, a language which he knows, which he's grown up with, which he understands. So, and I think that's the case for uh, most of the, trans I mean, all of the good translations that I feel that are good, mm -hmm. good trans translations. I think, I think that's the case where 
the person, the translator is a poet or a writer in the English language, the language that I'm reading, but they understand the language where it's coming from. So I think that's really essential in the entire process. And because when you read Chayad's poems, he wanted to, like he, he'd said that Naomi Lazad and uh, the Kian, and they had in fact did, done a good job with the translation of uh, Fez, but they'd failed to capture his emotional excitement, which is something only a South Asian will understand to, to, to some extent, because when you recite Fez's uh, poems, you can hear that, you can hear the rhythms, you can hear the sound of the poem and to really recapture that and like, to really like uh, bring it out in the English language, well, you, you need a translator who knows and understands uh, Fez's poetry in uh, Urdu. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is one instance in the book where I talk about uh, the translations of Mirza Ghalib uh, done by W.S. Mervyn and Adrian Rich. There, Shahid says completely, something completely different that Mervyn, Mervyn translated the couplet. Uh, and he'd achieved something that no one had ever done. He'd, he'd done it so well. But Mervyn would never know that because Mervyn can never understand uh, the original Urdu. So yeah. a translator who's translating from a language which the translator doesn't understand, uh, I think they'll never know, uh, you know how good a job they've done. Uh, so I think it's a really, I mean, it's, it sounds really complex, but when you come to it, when you when you when you really like start reading about it, 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 it is very simple. So I think it's there are a lot of factors at play here. So I think in picking translations, I think the best thing that one can do is go for translators who are writers and poets of the language you're reading, and that's the most important thing. I feel really. He wanted to, uh, Shahid wanted to kind of write poems that didn't really involve himself. Like he wanted to kind of keep a separation between, if I'm right, if I'm not sure, but he wanted to keep a separation right. between his like personal life or his politics and he wanted to keep the poem separate. So I think because he wanted everyone to kind of understand the poem in their own way and not make it very specific, right? right? Well, to some extent, yes. But I think, I mean, in a lot of cases, like when you read a collection like The Country Without a Post Office, his politics is very much present there, even though he considered he he he'd said very clearly that I don't consider myself a political poet. Yeah. But there is a lot of politics. There is a lot of politics. Running. Even when you look at a collection, yeah, even when you look at a collection like the uh, uh, a nostalgia's map of America, which were which includes poems that he'd written in Tucson while he was there. Uh he talks about the Bisbee deportation of 1917, where uh you know, I think I think miners were sent away uh, from uh, the camp, and uh, their wives were left, uh, and the wives and children were left uh, in the town, and they were deported. And eventually, like there was a huge, like you know, sort of like uh, uh, issue about it. But the Americans really don't like to talk about this issue. But when Chai went there, he discovered this, and he felt that he must write about. It. And that's the case uh, with country without a post office, because I think Chai, I mean Chai came from. Uh, Kashmir, and that yeah. was a very important part uh, in his poetry uh, because when he was writing uh, Half and Chamalayas, Kashmir was a very, uh, I mean, he used Kashmir as a very different, it, it was the idea of home that he was trying to explore. But by the time you reach the 90s, I think uh, all that was going on in Kashmir really impacted Shahid. So there is a lot of politics in his poetry, but there are things which he thought that he, I mean, he really just wasn't interested in uh, exploring as a poet. For example, when when uh, I mean, there's a lot of talk about Shahid's sexuality. Yeah. But the fact is that Shahid was never interested in exploring his uh, sexual identity as a poet. In fact, he once said that uh, you know he wanted the readers to respond to the fullness of his poetry, not because he was from a particular background. So, I mean, he was very. There are things which uh, he has written about, and there are things which he chose not to write about. Yeah. And I feel like in a lot of ways, Shahid, I mean, really uh, developed uh, like his politics towards as he grew. Um, I mean, I've compared him to the likes of like Cesar Vallejo and Fez Ahmed Fez and Gian Switzos, who were all like poets of injustice. And Shahid, like them, was a poet of injustice, but also a poet of fitness. His name meant two things, which he beautifully captures in that couplet. Uh, that says, uh, they asked me to tell them what Shahid means. Listen, listen. It means beloved in Persian, witness in Arabic. 
So he really played with both of these aspects really well. Uh, so he he explored the you know the, the beloved uh, the the relationship between the beloved and the lover in his poetry, especially in his guzzles. But he was also a witness who 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 saw like his homeland being ravaged by war and conflict and. Uh, I mean, he ended up writing about it, and it's one of the um, most famous collections uh, that have been, that that inspired so many people in Kashmir to write and young writers and poets. So I think that is a really important like uh, thing to understand about Shahid that there was a separation, yes, but I think he was tuned in a way where if he saw injustice, he would respond to it. He was taught that from a very young age, so that was very important uh, to him. He he. I'm surprised he didn't talk about being gay because he he lived through the AIDS epidemic in the U.S. and and right. you know, South Asian culture is very conservative. And being being gay in that kind of environment is really really tough. So I'm surprised he didn't talk about that. When you Google him, you don't. You don't and he wrote that. a poem about AIDS actually, uh, in, in in a poem. Yeah, yeah. In, in in search of evanescence, he talks about AIDS, and he talks about his friend uh, Philip right. Orlando. Right, uh, who had died because of uh, complications due to AIDS. Uh, so he addressed that, but I mean, when it came to his private life, his he wasn't really life. interested in, in exploring. Yeah, his love life, his private life. He liked to keep it very private. Yeah. So because in Child's case, like I mean, when you look at someone like a James Merrill, um, he had two partners. One was Peter Hooten and David Jackson, and uh, they. I mean, they were a big part of James Merrill's life. Whereas when it comes to Shahid, uh, I don't think he had any lovers or long-term relationships because there aren't any. Like you know, I mean, I've spoken with his family, with almost all of his friends, and he liked to keep his private life very private in that way. Okay. So, and no one's, I mean, really come forward over the past like twenty, thirty years, like claiming to be his lover or anything. So it's it's really like a question of what's well, I mean, what was he trying to do with his poetry? So he had this entire poetic persona where he had concerns, right? That he wanted to explore as a poet. And there were concerns that he didn't feel that he was interested in. So, I mean, it really comes down to that. He taught in the U.S. What was he like as a teacher, as a professor? He was really harsh. I mean, when it came to teaching, he was extremely harsh. He'd once said... Uh, I think a student came to him with a poem and I think Shahid read the line and he like immediately like he responded saying that this line should be put on a wall and shot. Oh. So, I mean, he was very harsh that way. And uh, I mean, he demanded a lot from his students. So uh, Kamila Shamsi, one of his students, uh, and I mean, the famous novelist, right? She uh, was Shahid's student at Hamilton. And she remembers that one time Shahid brought in a New York Times article and said that you had to write a poem using um, words that appeared in this article. So he was really trying to bind them in form and like he would teach them so many poets. He, he taught them poets from uh, South Asia. He taught uh, poets from the West and you know he was exploring all these different forms and he was so attuned to language that he wanted them to like you know, develop this sort of thing where they would have a sort of reaction the moment they hear a word. So he wanted them to really become aware of language in that way. And I think he was a really harsh teacher. And uh, But I mean, ultimately he did a lot of good to all his students. And uh, I've talked to about two or three people who studied under Shahid. And, you know, all of them said have said that we've, I mean, that's something like, you know, that experience was something that taught us so much. And we came out like changed and, you know, the, the, how we saw the world, how we approached our work, how we uh, approached language itself. And so Shahid as a teacher was, uh, yeah. And a lot of them, I, I, I think it comes from like, you know, he was trying to sort of like um, push them towards, uh, you know, the most difficult things like, you know, trying a poetic form like the Gazel or trying a Kanzon. So, Things like those, because I think he he really believed that if you've mastered like those aspects, you can then freely write in a lot of ways. That if you if you've sort of achieved, uh, you know, the, the level at which uh, poets like James Merrill were fu functioning, if you've really understood what they're trying to do, how they're trying to do it, I think 
that was very important to him he was trying to inculcate all of that into their you know world and how they approach literature so yeah yeah he was really but he was really harsh yes he, he yes. was teaching he yeah. was teaching a, a young generation of new writers and poets but also at the same time he was teaching he was trying to explain to his peers and his colleagues the true format of a ghazal and and how it should be right. written and right. he's trying right. to create this movement of trying to bring ghazals into american western society can you exp- can you elaborate on that and did he achieve success in that so i think when shahid came to the us in 75 he discovered the translations of uh, mirza ghalib which were commissioned by a pakistani critic ajaz ahmed and he provided american poets with uh, transliterations uh, of the urdu ghazal and the translators were american poets who didn't know urdu so adrian rich ws mervin david ray they all ended up translating the ghazals except they didn't use the form and the ghazal has a very strict form where there is an end rhyme there is a refrain there is a meter I mean, there are base elements which you know form a real ghazal, what Shahid calls a real ghazal. Um, but his, his his problem really wasn't with the translations, but that the fact that poets like Adrian Rich and Phyllis Webb and Jim Harrison had started writing ghazals, but they weren't really using the form. So when he came to the US and he realized that this was going on, uh, I mean, a lot of people say that well, he had a problem with this because it was like sort of cultural appropriation, this that. But yeah. really, the question—I mean, his, his approach was very different. I mean, he didn't think it was cultural appropriation or anything. He thought that he really believed that if American poets, Western poets, really understood the form and all they could do with it, they could work wonders. So, really, his attempt was to try and uh, explain the form to them, to explain what it, what could, what could be done with the form, what it could do. Uh, I mean, Shahid, I think in one of the, yeah, yeah, I think in one of his uh, essays, he called it, you know, he said that you almost have to become a slave to the form. And then you you have to basically try to like master the master. So that is really what's what's at work, uh, what's at play in uh, Agazal. And I think uh, he he wrote to so many poets. Uh, he, he didn't know them and he would write them, write letters to them saying, well, listen, I don't know you. But here is a form that uh, comes from like, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's there in uh, South Asia and it comes from like uh, Arabic and Persian and this and that. And why don't you try it? And eventually, like uh, so many poets ended up like writing uh, the ghazal and, you know, he gave them instructions as to what has to be done. The kafia, the, the various elements of the ghazal. And uh, eventually, like Shahid ended up with an anthology of ghazals written by American poets uh, called uh, the ravish, uh, Ravishing Disunities. And in so many ways, he's transformed uh, Ghazal writing in uh, English language. And it's had what you call a pizza effect, right? Um, Ghazals were primarily written and uh, you know sung in uh, Urdu and yeah. Persian and the Indian subcontinent. But it was only after Shahid started writing uh, Ghazals in English. Now it's come back. I think after a decade and people in India who are English poets have started exploring the form in English. And I mean, I remember I was speaking with one of Shahid's friends who also happens to be the director of an MFA program at uh, University of Iowa. Um, and he said that like, you know, the Ghazal has become such an integral part of all the MFA courses that it's taught in literally like all of the uh, universities now as a poetic form. And uh, Shahid, has to be is the one who has to be credited for all of that because he really made an effort uh, to try and explain the form, the intricacies, and uh, how it has to be done and what what they can achieve with the form. Because I mean, most of uh, the Western poet, most of I mean, most of Western poetry is written primarily in three words. Whereas when you approach uh, your subjects uh, using a form like the Ghazal. Uh, it it gives you this sort of freedom as well, uh, even though it's like you know putting all these restrictions uh, yeah. on you with all these formal demands. So I think it was a form that he really wanted to explore, and I think you know uh, the fact that he was so close to Begum Akhtar, and he really admired her singing and uh, the the ghazals that she would sing. I think she was the one who really like made him appreciate the form and explore it, and 
so there is this like sort of like this unity uh, in in the ghazal where one couplet could be about god the next couplet could be about you know your lover the third could be a political uh, you know you could explore something political in that so, but it was all uh, it all came together with the refrain which would be similar in all the ghazals and i think that is what basically shah had wanted to explore and like you know uh, inform the western readers and the poets that this is the form and this is what you can do with it and now i mean i think a lot of american poets are experimenting with the form and they've really explored the form so i mean the other day i was um, reading an article by an american poet who i think read shahid's ghazals in prison and he really responded to the couplet uh, where shahid calls himself a witness to the extent that he changed his name to shahid in prison wow. uh, to reflect his position as a witness so i mean that's the impact shahid has had on um, you know poets in the west so i think he's really done like a wonderful job and he's really like uh, popularized the form for uh, the entire world i discovered shahid a few years ago so but was shahid always on the yeah. map was he always very popular from the beginning um from when he moved to the us when did he move when he started publishing his books in the us was he did he was he big or did he just get is he getting bigger and bigger after his death he's getting bigger now because when he moved to the us uh that was in 75 right yeah. and it wasn't until i think and he was doing his phd and his he was constantly writing poetry but um uh, i think half in chamalayas came out in 1987 and that's when i think people really started responding to shahid's poetry it was this really unique language that he used and even someone like james merrill was uh, very uh, fond of his poetry and you know the way he wrote so there was like critical acclaim and all of that and i think eventually uh, over the next couple of years by the time like you know the 90s uh, he started writing country, uh, the country without a post office shahid was a very popular poet and a very popular professor and teacher as well because he taught so many people and he was really in demand for that way yeah uh, but no honestly after his death i think uh, i mean shahid has become extremely popular and he i think i think he's one of the few poets from the subcontinent who has this sort of like response even so many after years after his death now so i think that way um i mean because when i was growing up i i mean i remember reading uh a lot of the poets from india but i could never like relate to them and this is the case with so many young readers i have received like i think uh, 12 or 13 messages from you know 17 18 year old girls girls and boys saying that well we read one essay about shahid then we explored his poetry and now we're really like responding to him so that way i think shahid has now like become very very popular uh, i think he's one of the most quoted poets on twitter uh, wow. from from the subcontinent so yeah that's that's really uh, yeah he's he's very accessible because someone like me who grew up in canada who who does who didn't know all these classical poems and poets and don't really understand have a hard time understanding right. shaid kind of has shaid and your book actually is like a nice gateway to this huge <laughs> world of of you know fez and all these poets and ghazal singers which you know and i can kind of like it makes it easier right. for me to kind of access these this this world this beautiful world and shahid he's very you know he's he comes from the south asian subcontinent but at the same time he writes in english and he grew, and he studied in the states so he's kind of like right. in a space where he can kind of connect with everybody in every level right no definitely because i mean shahid i mean one because he wrote in english primarily yeah. i mean i mean english was his he considered english his first language so that way he's a he's accessible to i mean i think most of the world uh, most of the english speaking world so and the fact that he brings this you know language and this uh, all these like cultural contexts and stuff like that in his poetry and all of that really like you know comes through and the language that he uses the subjects that he uh, sort of explores in his uh, poems i think mm-hmm. that's the reason for his like appeal uh primarily yeah yeah because yeah. i mean as an english language poet uh, i mean in the 70s when he was in india i think there wasn't a lot of scope at that time to be very honest and uh, that was one of the reasons that shahid moved to the us because he considered english his first language 
And uh, that was the language he wrote his first poem in when he was nine years old. And I think that was one of the major reasons uh, the child moved to the United States. And yeah, I mean, really, that's really like made his poetry accessible to a lot of people and uh, all that he explores through um, his poems. Yeah. If someone listening wants to start reading his work, what poem collection do you think they should start with? Hmm. I, I really think, um, I mean, I really think one should pick up The Whale Suite, which is his collected works, right? So it includes poems from all the collections. And I would suggest that they go through in a chronological order because um, the way this uh, collect, the, the collected works has been set up is that accessible poems that he wrote uh, in the 70s when he was still in Delhi or uh, you know, and, and these poems are really like the poems that I, I mean, I, I grew up with. So a poem like a poem like Stationery, uh, Shahid actually called these poems uh, crowd pleasers. I mean, they were really at, at poetry readings. They were meant to reel the audience in before he started reading like his, his uh, uh, you know, the not the better works, but sort of the, the more complex poems and stuff like that. So these these were really simple poems. So a poem like Stationery or uh, or, or maybe uh, there's one cremation and like there's uh, a rehearsal for loss. And these are really simple poems, but I mean, you can really like see what Shahid's trying to do with the language, with how he's written it, with the effect that it has on you. And then slowly, I think one can like start approaching like a collection. I mean, because I, I really, I, I know for a fact that, and this is something that a lot of people have told me that when you pick up a collection like Rooms Are Never Finished, which was his final collection, with, like without reading any of his other poems it's really i mean uh i mean for, for a lot of people it's it's tough to understand what's going on because he's playing with all these forms and it's really complex because he's dealing with his mother's death uh trying to make sense of the world without her and so there's a lot at play there uh but a collection like half and chamanayas is i think the perfect uh place to start if you want to if someone wants to like explore shahid's poetry really right Speaking of his mom, his mom dies. He grieves. How does grief change him? And or like, what was his grieving process? And it's ironic. I it's in a twisted ironic faith. He suffers the same death that his mom does. Right. No, I I really think. I mean, he was really close to his mother, and yeah. she shaped him. Like you know, she really like she was the person who really shaped him. Like this uh, side of him who, and I mean, you know, um, Shahid. I think got to know about his mother's condition in 96, 95, 96, and she was brought to the US. And uh, so he knew that she was going to die. And yeah. eventually when Magic. she passed away, I it, it, it really broke him. I mean, uh, I think for he, he said in one of the interviews that for a year he couldn't write. Uh, that was the sort of effect that uh, his mother's death had had on him. and. Uh, his mother's last wish was that uh, that that she wanted to be buried in Kashmir. So, I mean, there's this whole like poem that he writes about. He writes about it in one of the poems, uh, "From Amos to Kashmir." So, uh, they had to get the body back from Amos to Kashmir, and he talks about the entire journey. And I mean, the collection "Rooms Are Never Finished" finally came out in 2001. So. It took about a year and a year or one and a half years to like really deal with uh, the loss. And I mean, when you read the collection, I mean, I didn't really have to like talk to people to understand uh, what he was going through because it's so evident from the collection itself. Even though, I mean, yes, a lot of people added to you know some of the things, and there were the, like, there were these stories that they would tell me about uh, that phase. But a lot of it is just evident from the poems. Um, I think when I think. The first poem that he wrote after his mother's death was the first poem in Rooms Are Never Finished, which is Lennox Hill, where she was, uh, the name of the hospital where uh, she was in New York. Um, and it's a really tough form, the Kanzo. It's one of the toughest forms uh, of poetry. Um, at the time when Shahid was writing these Kanzons, uh, I think Anthony, the poet Anthony Hecht had uh, said that Shahid should be given a Guinness uh, world like, record or something to for writing like three uh, canzones because no one in the history of poetry had like done that uh, oh. I think at that point and 
I mean, really, that form helped Shahid approach, you know, uh, his father's death in so many ways because it gave him this sort of distance. And I mean, eventually, uh, then in the in ninety nine, when Shahid got to know about his own condition, and it, in one of the interviews, it, he actually said that, you know, um, in so many ways, he felt that uh, his 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 brain tumor was sort of this response to his mother's death. So he'd said that in one of the interviews and even though like you know uh, science uh, tells us that it is not a hereditary disease or i mean it's, it's not a condition that can be passed on mm-hmm. um so really like the question here is like you know if one believes in like the separation between the body and the mind or if you think that it is you know one thing and then that you know an event like this the passing away of you know someone who you love so deeply can cause uh, a reaction like and and it can like you know sort of like uh, have this impact on you or affect you in a certain way so i mean really that was a very tough phase for him uh, also because uh, in 1997 i think uh, ikbal ahmed who was his very good friend uh, he passed away and in 95 james merrill who considered uh, you know who shahid loved his works and uh, i think he was one of the for Shahid, I think he was one of the most important poets and he'd gotten in touch with him and they were really good friends. And in 95, Merrill had passed away. So there were these three sort of like three deaths uh, year after year that he had to sort of deal with. And eventually when, it, when uh, I think he writes about all of them in his poem, A Dream I'm at the Ghat of the Only World, where he sort of like evokes everyone. Uh, and even like I think Begum Akhtar. So it's sort of like, you know, I think Amitav Ghosh had said this to me that, uh, I mean, when his friends read it, when all of those people read that poem, they sort of like, you know, the first reaction was that that this is sort of like Shahid's farewell to the world. Because when you really read the poem, you, you, you can sense that and you can see why at that specific time when they were aware of Shahid's condition and Shahid was reading out this poem about all the people who were close to him and all of them had passed away, uh, why? all of them would feel that way and so it was a really you know tough time for him yeah. and uh, yeah yeah he yeah. he his mom is buried in kashmir and and for someone who you know i was surprised to find that he wanted to be buried in the us what was what was the reason why he right. wanted to be buried in the us and not you know kashmir no so he 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 really uh, no 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 so he wanted to be buried in kashmir for the first okay. time like that okay. is the that was what he wanted but the thing was that he'd experienced the entire journey, uh, uh, you know, from the U.S. to Kashmir, like you have to take the body. And it's a very, uh, I mean, he'd experienced that and he felt that, well, you know, I've lived in the U.S. for so long. So, I mean, when he when he thought about his family and all that they had to go through, yeah. he finally, I think, decided that, you know, uh, just it, it'll be like, you know, it, 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 you, you don't really have to take me all the way back to Kashmir and then do all of that. Like, you know, just bury me in like uh, Northampton. And then, uh, and he was actually, uh, I mean, um, yeah. So that, I think that was the reason, even though like, you know, Shahid never talked about it himself. So uh, that that's, that's I think what I understand uh, uh, from all the conversations that I've had with his friends and family, that it was a decision that he took way off, like when he was, aware of his uh, imminent death and uh, yeah yeah who are you gonna write about next oh i think climate change definitely i've been i've been reading a lot about climate change and i mean today i mean i was watching this entire thing uh, in the gulf of mexico where the sea where the ocean got on fire i don't know yeah if right now seen that but I'm, i mean i mean it's, it's crazy i mean it really i think uh, and it's been on my mind for a very long time. And I think I feel like I must respond to it in one way or another, even though like there are scientists and like people who are like doing all the research. I think that's, it's a very pressing issue that I feel that, um, you know, one can write about and one can talk about it to generate more awareness to maybe like you know, do something more. But I mean, it's still a very nascent idea and still like, sort of like working around it and what to do and how to approach it because it's really so complex. I mean, I've been reading so much and um, there are so many different like approaches that people have taken. So it's it's really a question of uh, what sort of 
uh, what aspect do I want to explore? Because if you really start to explore the entire thing, it's it's, it's very difficult. And I think Naomi Klein has done that uh, in her book, uh, This yeah. Changes Everything, which is just brilliant, brilliant work. I think Amitav but, Ghosh uh, talks a lot about climate change yeah. in his in his Yeah, book. in the great great arrangement, and uh, I mean, and and especially his fiction. I mean, it's now like you know, it's taking a turn where he's talking about climate change and uh, how that's leading to like migration, and uh, so he's exploring all of that. So it's 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 really like a, a complex thing that I'm like trying to understand now to sort of like you know explore uh, in the future. So let's see how that how that goes, but. Uh, yeah so, I, I really really enjoyed the book yeah. <laughs> okay. like thank you yeah. so much thank you so much yeah. take care thank you thank you for Bye. your time thank you thank bye you.